hi. <laughs> um, who here knows me, has heard my story? Knows me, heard my story. <laughs> okay, um, let me say one thing. One thing I noticed about this scripture yesterday when I was mulling it over in me is that Jesus, the Father from heaven, validated him right before he went into the wilderness. It was a Kairos moment where he knew who he belonged to, he knew who he was, and he was loved, and God said, I'm pleased with you, son. And then the Holy Spirit <laughs> led him into the wilderness. So um, just so that you would know that Jesus also knows how it feels for you. He needed validation. Did he need it? Mm, maybe. He got it. So we need that. Okay. So what I'm going to share with you is my story plus some stuff. And I'm going to mostly read it or I won't be able to talk. So having been healthy and a runner for 30 years, I started AAU track and field when I was 10 years old. So from 10 to 40, I ran city track. It was fun. And um, I was preparing for a marathon. I had just moved to Kansas City. I was starting to prepare for a marathon. And um, I started getting sick. I contracted an autoimmune disease, spending time, energy, and finances attempting to find a cure. I became more ill by the day, life-threatening weight loss and literally starving. I couldn't drink water without getting sick. I weighed 85 pounds. 18 months of extreme pain and fatigue, wondering how would I care for my husband, John, in the front row, and my five-year-old partially disabled son, Cart, in the front row. Love you, Cart. Glad to be your mom. My last option for survival was major surgery to remove my large intestine. I really wanted to die. Scary but necessary surgery because there were no medications then that could put this illness into remission like there are now. After a botched surgery, yeah, botched, where am I? It saved my life, but it messed me up. And a month in the hospital, I spent eight more months in more pain than before the botched surgery. A second opinion from a surgeon made it clear that I should pursue Cleveland Clinic in Ohio to repair what he had, what the guy had messed up. And you know, I could have taken him to court. No, I was looking for Jesus in the middle of it. So I repeated the procedure, but this time with the surgeon who was recognized at the best, as the best in his field in the world. And that was really God's provision because our health insurance said, yes, we'll financially cover that whole process, probably $150,000 worth even though it's out of network. So after the successful redo and three months to recover, I had a final surgery and thought, okay, I'm done. Let's move on with my life. And a year later, I needed another major surgery. Back to Cleveland Clinic, I went. Complications often follow long-term illness, and I was no different than anyone else. I began to have an abnormal heart rate and I decided that instead of being anxious, I was going to stop mid-sentence. Like if I was having a conversation, I would stop mid-sentence and I would say, Jesus, I love you and I trust you with my life. And he answered with a deep reassurance of his love for me. In the beginning of all the trauma, yeah, I wondered, why me? I've been good. I was a good Catholic. How could you let this happen to me? I've been so good. And what I saw so clearly, and this was 1.30 in the morning one night where I had, after the botched surgery, I had to sleep sitting up propped on the couch because I couldn't lay down. It was too painful. So those two months of agony and fighting with God and saying, 
how dare you? I promise you, God can handle your I dare you. He can handle it. He'd rather have you do that, be real, than not say anything. So I was pretty desperate. I saw the depravity of my own heart of the, I'm an American, and this is really American. I deserve a happy life. We're fed that as kids here. And, you know, granted, I grew up on the other side of the tracks in L.A. I still felt like I deserved a happy life. I was angry. I was desperate. Those around me became uncomfortable with my neediness, afraid that they would say or do something wrong, so they simply stayed away. And I was really alone. My family was 5,000 miles away and didn't come. Then one day, isn't that the great part of the story? Then one day, after many months in the house of prayer in Kansas City, five days a week, two hours a day, I was in the prayer room pouring my guts out to God, asking him to heal me. Why didn't he want to heal me? And one day, that day, one of those days, I knew that I knew that I knew that I wasn't alone and that I would never be forsaken because scripture promises. I knew that God can only be good. He can't be anything else. If he says he's good, he's good. So from then on, my heart softened. And I knew his presence more deeply than ever. He loved me, and whatever bruising he allowed in my life, he also promised to heal. That's in Isaiah. On this side of heaven, but definitely on the other side. I knew that nothing touched me without touching him first, and nothing I experienced would be wasted in the kingdom. I spoke truth to myself regularly, daily, hourly, the medication-induced couch time and sleepless nights. Be, uh, sorry. The medication-induced couch time, sleepless nights were filled with his presence. He would sing songs to me like, Hush, my darling, don't fear, my darling, the lion sleeps tonight. Because you know the lion, he's looking for someone to devour. I knew that he was my safe haven. On one occasion, after I was at the um, IHOP, I was walking in a parking lot. I still had groceries to get. I still had laundry to do. I still had stuff to do. I was getting out of my car, and I felt this tap on my shoulder, and I looked back to see who it was, and there was no one in the parking lot but me. And it was God reminding me, I'm still here, I'm still here, I'm never going to leave you. He made it clear that he was always near. And as I embraced my suffering, my perspective changed. And I realized that weakness, physical or emotional, is not our enemy. Weakness is not your enemy. God is attracted to weakness. He runs to those who humbly admit their need. I needed him desperately. My prayer for release from the agony changed to God. Please don't let me out of this oven until I have everything you want for me out of it. His voice, his word, his friendship, his fragrance had become so precious to me. I was willing to be encompassed by anything in order to have him. I'm going to describe one surgery um, I went in for uh, this, the prepare, repair surgery at, it was supposed to be like a 6.30 p.m. surgery. And um, I waited, and I waited, and I'm, you know, I'm IV'd, I'm ready. And I waited, and I waited, and they kept wheeling in. Uh, Cleveland Clinic, by the way, is, is like Mayo. Hi, hi, everybody wants to go there to get healed or fixed, whatever. Um, I waited and waited, and my poor husband is out in the waiting room not knowing, did she go into surgery yet? Okay, so seven hours later, 1.30 in the morning, 
Finally, I'm in the operating room, and I'm laying there calm. Jesus was there. I, he wasn't going to let that guy take me out, even if he didn't have any sleep. He wasn't going to do it. So I'm laying there, and now there are two anesthesiologists, one on each side, trying to find an IV site because the one on my hand blew, and they had to find another one. And I was so dehydrated because, you know, you don't eat, drink before surgery. So um, I was so dehydrated. Two of them are working on me, looking in my head, looking in my neck. So I'm being poked like crazy. And I look down to the bottom of my feet, and I see the nurse strapping my feet onto the table. And I go, oh, you really do that? Strap us on? And they were startled because I was paying attention. I should have been freaking out, right? Wouldn't you have been freaking? I should have been freaking out. But I was at so much peace. So then I'm listening to the music, and I go, oh, the surgeon likes country music. So they had music playing. And, and um, I see my surgeon through the window. He keeps looking in, like, is she ready? Is she ready? Because <laughs> he hasn't had any sleep. So um, I, And I'm chuckling with them, and they're looking at me like, who is this lady? Anyway, so the anesthesiologist says, okay, Mrs. Deshaw, we found a spot. We're ready to go. Start counting. Well, I had, you know, they t have you count back from 100. I had decided, okay, counting. Uh, no, no, no. I need something else. So I had a song that always was in my head. My hope is built, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I'd get to the end of that, and I was out. <laughs> so I'd sing that every time. So as I'm singing that, the anesthesiologist, this one here, is looking at me like, what? who is this person? All that to say, I was at peace. I was afraid, yeah, but I was at peace. You can be afraid, you can be in pain, and you can be at peace. Yeah. You, you don't have to be kicked in the head by the enemy. Um, he wants to kick you in the head, but anyway. So I won't be running any marathons, bummer, or eating many of my favorite foods until I eat them with him in eternity. I still have pain five days out of seven, and my health is compromised. But I would walk it all again just to find him. My heart soars at the sound of his voice and his pleasure in me is at times overwhelming. He sees the bullseye on my heart, and he aims for it every day. I do this to some of you guys sometimes. <laughs> He's aiming. And I believe that God has a plan to heal me. He's going to heal me. He promised he would. He's going to heal me. It might not be on this side of heaven, but it definitely will be on the other side. And he's going to heal my son. We hope on this side of heaven but for sure on the other side. And so I'm not going to stop praying for people to get healed up here because I know how my God feels about me. And I'm not going to stop. And I heard the Lord, been hearing the Lord say all morning long to say to you, the tough times are going to happen. You can't get out of it. You're peaceful little life that you want doesn't exist doesn't exist it's a fairy tale and it's a lie that the enemy has used to keep you from loving Jesus with everything you've got in you I love him with everything I've got in me I used to dance in the prayer room in Kansas City I had an ostomy that is a stoma I was 40 years old that's for old people I was 40 years old, and I would dance across the room holding my stoma because it hurt. And I'd have people coming up to me all the time saying, crying, crying to me, looking at me. I can't believe you're doing this, Patty. I can't believe. And I'm going, what? I'm just worshiping Jesus because the rest of it didn't really. It existed, and I was in pain. But God taught me how to live above it. You can. You can. We can live above it. We only do it one day at a time and one choice at a time, but we can live above it. Well, let's stand together as we pray. Remember that Patty pray for us.
Just stay standing. You know, I'll be here on a, on a Sunday morning, and I'll watch Patty praying with people that are in tremendous pain. Stay standing. Don't sit down yet. And uh, I know the pain Patty's in as she's praying for people. And it's the most beautiful thing as a church that believes for healing. We trust the Lord in the process. And there are things we don't understand. We don't get his timing. But we trust him. We trust him in that process. We trust him in that journey. Let's just close our eyes as we, as we pray this morning. I have Patty pray here in a second. God, we just pray for grace. God, we thank you for the tests that you bring our way. And God, we ask that we would not fall subject to the enemy's temptation. Lord, that we can trust you in the journey. We can trust you in the process that as you are faithful, help us remain faithful. So right now with eyes closed, you say, you know what? You're in the middle of a serious test. You're in a trial and you need God's grace and strength. Just lift your hand up if that's you. Keep your hand up. Father, we just pray right now for strength to fill this house. Empower your people. I'm going to have Patty pray for us. Lord, we ask you to help us settle in our hearts that you're a good God no matter what our lives look like, that you don't love someone else better than you love us. Lord, would you help us to recognize that everything you do in our lives has life in it. Everything you do produces life, Jesus. Would you help us to know that? God, I ask for my family here at The Rock that you would help us know that every situation, there's an invitation to trust you, an invitation to know you deeper, an invitation to really be near you like we want to be. We want to know you. God, help us to make peace with that truth that you're always here, that you will never, never, never leave us to face life alone, ever. And that we've never, ever been alone. God, I ask for a time this week for my family to know that they know that they know that you're the God who loves them, who runs to them when they say, I'm struggling. I'm weak. This week, I ask for a divine appointment for each person in this room to know you in a bigger way. And Lord, we ask, we take authority over the enemy right now, and we say no to your confusion. We say no to that spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. We say no to the lies that tell us, ah, you're nobody. We say no to that in the name of Jesus. Lord, we make peace with the truth we belong to you and that makes us significant we thank you for loving us so well Jesus come and do what only you can do in us in Jesus name amen